Hi everyone, I'm Alex Milner-Smith. I'm the co-head of the Data, Privacy and Cyber team at Lewis Silkin, the UK Yus Laboris uh, member. Um, delighted to be joined today by Ingeva Helst from Claes & Engels, who leads the Data and Privacy team there. Um, as you can see, we're in uh, sort of sunny Athens, as it was yesterday, possibly going to rain, but wonderful location. Um, for me, having a wonderful topic as well, data, perhaps others might want to talk about something else and go on the beach, but we're here to speak about data. Um, <laughs> There's obviously many things happening in the world of data at present, the metaverse, international transfers, monitoring, and of course, AI. But bearing in mind we're two weeks from May 25th, 2023, it would be remiss of us not to talk about the five year anniversary of GDPR and where we've gone. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, um, you know, why don't you tell us what you feel has gone well with GDPR? and what you perhaps feel has gone, shall we not say badly, but could be improved. Nothing's ever bad. Things can always just be improved. Yeah, I think what, what worked really well uh, is you, if you look at the purpose of the GDPR when it was created, the, the main purpose was to put it on the agendas of the, the boards mm. and to make sure that companies would really become compliant with data protection uh, legislation. And that worked pretty well. Also, if you look at the evolution of the fines over the last five years, we, we can see an increase uh, with, I think, last year, a record-breaking uh, year with an yep. increase of 50% uh, of, of the total fines uh, in, in the European Union. Um, and, and so, yeah, that worked well. We couldn't, I think both of us had loads of work with yep. uh, assisting companies in, in being compliant uh, with, and with and GDPR. I, and I think, what, I, uh, I think that it's a very good point you mentioned about fines. Over the first couple of years, the fines were lower and there was some commentary, well, this, this is a toothless piece of legislation. Yeah. But I think regulators were trying to give time to controllers and processors in the workplace, obviously, to, to, to learn how to engage with GDPR before going in with big yeah. fines. But now we're five years later, and I think the regulators are saying, no excuses anymore, and that's yeah. why we're seeing these yeah. big fines. So yeah. probably increasing next year and this year. There as well. are some differences in countries that we can see. I think Belgium, we are still quite okay if we compare with, uh, with yeah. other countries. Our data protection authority is giving a lot of uh, warnings. Yeah. Um, but, but Again, in Belgium, we can also see uh, some, some increase. I mean, that's an interesting one. I mean, we, we in the UK, we're obviously outside the European Union now, but yeah. GDPR is still broadly the same in the UK. And we have a very practical regulator as well. Um, but it is different. If you, if you look at what the CNIL is doing in France and the yeah. Garante, you could almost sometimes think they are looking at different legislation. Yeah. And obviously the Irish DPC is caught in the middle where they probably want to be a practical regulator because they have so many tech companies. Yeah. Um, and yet they are, I'm afraid, under the auspices of the European Data Protection Board procedure, yeah. having to be told what to do by, you know, a German regional regulator or the Italian regulator. So but what do you think's gone what do you think's gone wrong? What's what's gone wrong or, or <laughs> less effective is um, I know when the announcement was there in 2018, uh, we have the GDPR. It's one set of rules for mm. all all over Europe. Mm. And, and a lot of uh, companies, especially the US, thought, hey, we just contact one council who will make uh, apply uh, the same set of rules for, for the whole continent. And that didn't really work out as it was supposed to, to work out. Because uh, we can see that there are still different interpretations in yep. many countries. Um, different uh, different legislation as well yep. still room for for local uh, legislation i think i think that the the implementing yeah. legislation in each country is different and that nuance yeah. i think maybe pre gdpr you might say it was 70% the same rules and 30% different it's probably yeah. now 85% the same rules but there's there's differences even between regions in germany in the yeah. same country exactly so what we are actually seeing from our clients is sometimes you you you, you perfect compliance is almost impossible to achieve. Mm -hmm. So if you go for eight or eight and a half or nine out of 10 compliance, and you just yeah. have to recognize there might be a nuance you miss and you sort of have to accept, uh, you have to have some risk tolerance because otherwise you would have to go to 27 member states yeah. and the exactly. UK. Yeah. And that just becomes enormously costly I think, yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, just from my perspective, I, I think it's, I, I really do agree with you about being on the board's radar and, you know, We've seen privacy champions. We've seen an, a, a vast increase in privacy professionals as well. Mm -hmm. People from the engineering side, from the security side, from the legal side, from the DPO side. And I think that can only be better for data subjects. That is the whole point, isn't it? To protect data subjects. Yeah. And it, although we are seeing perhaps um, claims being weaponized, as it were, occasionally by employees, in the main, I think most employees and workers can see 
businesses grappling with a difficult piece of legislation, but trying to be more transparent, trying to be more proportionate, and trying to be fair. Absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, I think we'll see, well, I mentioned AI earlier, we'll see how AI and GDPR interact. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Europe's got its new AI Act as well. So we're, I think there's going to be another phase of slight confusion and, and legislative um, issues that companies yeah. work through. But if, if, I would, if, if I was to ask you to give it out of 10, what would you say GDPR gets out of 10 now? Out of 10? Well, a score, what would you give it? Ah, <laughs> um, a difficult question um, because there are so many aspects yeah, in, in, a, in just GDPR. Give me a number. I will give you a seven. <laughs> seven, okay, good. I think seven's about right. And I, and I, I, I do think that that harmonization and cooperation so you can, as a business, a US multinational, let's say, can have one point of entry and then understand that the rules that they're being told about in France are the same everywhere would be an enormous yeah. um, boon for the GDPR. But it, we'll just have to see where it goes. Yeah. Just moving on to a few specific things. How, how do you think that the GDPR has changed HR programs, processes, protocols, yeah. maybe run us through recruitment, onboarding? Yeah in employment and then termination? I really think GDPR, data protection uh, laws, have had a huge impact on HR policy uh, in general. And really from the start of the process on the recruitment and the onboarding during the employment relationship and at uh, the exit. I think in recruitment, uh, it's just very important for companies always to bear in mind, not to, to, uh, to uh, scrutinize or screen uh, job applicants in a too privacy intrusive mm. way, mm. only ask questions that are relevant. Mm. Uh, we've seen a lot of yeah, change through uh, recruitment processes uh, all over Europe, I think. All focusing um, on minimization and transparency abs probably, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yes. Um, and and uh, also, yeah, take care with questions and, and certainly when it relates to sensitive data and think about criminal records, for example. Absolutely. <laughs> Although that is an example where there are different rules in every single country and, and different, not just yeah. different legal rules, but a different um, cultural approach to yeah. certain things. I think yeah. in the UK, we're far more like the US. It's much more common to check criminal background checks. Whereas if yeah. you if you go across Europe and you get to Eastern Europe, it's far less common. Yeah. You know, and, and, and then there's every country in between. So that can be difficult for a global recruitment yeah. program where probably led from the US where they just want to do the same thing. And mm -hmm. the answer has to be, I'm afraid you can't because there is some risk there. Yeah, so. But I, I think in many European countries, they were just checking the criminal uh, background. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with the GDPR, it's very clear. You can yeah. only do that yeah. if you have a legal exception, which yeah. for instance in Belgium only applies to a minor very narrow, uh, category of, yeah. uh, of jobs. So have to be, take care what, of that. What, what, what about during employment? Have you been, well, we've obviously worked together a lot, but we, yeah. we've seen in the UK, um, it, it's funny, GDP has both been empowering perhaps for HR teams, but also there's a feeling of restriction. We've, we've had a lot of discussions about how much monitoring can you do? Yeah. And I think that discussion will only go on. Or how do you performance manage? We're having discussions now with lots of our clients about can we monitor people working from home? Yeah. And, and yeah. GDPR you know, overlays all of that. And you have to consider that alongside ER yeah. relations. But have yeah, you seen that funny. kind of thing in Belgium? Yeah. Exactly. And it's funny because in these five years, of course, we've had the pandemics and uh, working from home uh, being uh, yeah, really increased in, in, yeah. in, the, in various countries. And there's been a shift, I think, in, in, the, in the, the, the questions that came to us. Uh, in first instance, the question was really, how do we monitor whether people are really working from home? Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of distrust with yeah. companies uh, and, and we've got sometimes quite crazy questions, maybe not so crazy for you, but yeah. crazy for us. Like, um, and we want to use a tool which sends every five minutes a screenshot of the computer screen of the employee yeah, sure. to the employer yeah. just to check the employee was or really bit, or working. Or camera eye tracking and yeah, so on. Exactly, yeah, exactly, where we had to say, yeah, don't think that will work. Sure. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, just checking uh, badging uh, data is fine. Yeah. Um, but now we see a shift that they want to check whether the people are returning to the office. Yeah. Yeah. And can you check access data, which seems quite normal to check that? But that's a funny one, isn't it? Because it really is quite, as we'd say in the UK, vanilla processing. Yeah. I mean, I have yeah. had a, I, I don't have it on me, but I've got my Lewis Silken Pass and I've used it for 15 years yeah. and it tracks me. Um, and yeah, we've had a lot of questions about that. that. That's an example of where sometimes people still feel restricted by GDPR, whereas if they should yep. feel empowered that as long as they're being transparent, they probably yep. have a lawful basis there. It's going to broadly yeah. be fine. But I think it's that mixture between not quite seeing the difference between more intrusive monitoring and just basic day-to-day -day functions. The exactly. GDPR was never intended to prevent that. It was no. just to do it in a fair and transparent. And just be very transparent. Exactly. Uh, exactly. The message is it's fine to do it, but just 
make it clear to your employees that you will use the, 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 the yeah. access data for that purpose as well. 100%. I mean, yeah. and let's talk about something that sometimes happens on termination, although it does happen um, yeah. during employment. Even before GDPR, we had a culture in the UK of, of employees, workers filing subject access requests yeah. and, and obviously other requests, erasure requests and so mm -hmm. on. Um, GDPR brings that more into law, makes it very clear. There was a campaign around it. You yeah. know, the ICO has made very clear that they believe data subject rights are a fundamental pillar of GDPR. Mm -hmm. But I, I know from my working practice that it wasn't that common no. in continental Europe, it more wasn't. common in Ireland, common law jurisdiction and so on, but was not common to receive a SAR. But has there been a rise in Belgium and, and across continental yeah. Europe of yeah. SARS? Yeah. yeah, but only recently. I would right. say only last year we've really seen an increase of uh, data subject access and, requests. And, and typically are they tactical? Upon termination. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just what you uh, always sure. <laughs> predicted to us. Uh, yeah. Or just the same as we see in the UK. It's now come over yeah. to, to the continent. And I mean, there is an example, although I said earlier that UK GDPR and GDPR are broadly synonymous. Um, we have a very practical regulator in relation to SARS. That they have um, released very practical guidance um, in that you have to do a good job, you have to help the data subject understand how you process personal data, but they have put in place limits around proportionality. Mm -hmm. You don't have to look under every stone. Yeah. Obviously, the European Data Protection Board has released slightly different guidance, which I fear may be quite difficult for our continental European neighbours to work through because theoretically, you know, you might have to look at a million. Yeah. data sets, which yeah. is very difficult. Of course, the uh, regulator might say, why do you have a million data sets? You should have retained far fewer yeah. data sets. But yeah. it's going to be very interesting how to that be honest, plays through. Yeah, to be honest, I don't find them very practical. So no. I would also use the ICO ones because <laughs> sure. uh, they're very practical and very, uh, very helpful. And based around GDPR. Uh, so you're always going to have an argument, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's interesting you say that, Inga, because I obviously work across Europe with many firms uh, and all around the world. And the number of times I've heard people say, well, we always look at the ICO guidance because yeah. there's so much. Yeah. It's very clear. Very detailed. There are checklists. Yeah. There are templates. There are yeah. wonderful scenarios. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Keneal is very good at that as well, but it's obviously in French. So it's harder to, 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 to grapple well, with. Not but a problem for me. No, not a problem for you. Not a problem for you. But for me, as, as, as a terrible linguist it is. But no, that, 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 that actually comes on to one other point. We, we as um, Michelle Rose, we in the UK are currently going through uh, uh, parliamentary discussions about a data reform act. Mm -hmm. which will subtly tweak a few points in GDPR. But just um, to give an example of, of the practicality of the British government, they have said, if you comply with GDPR, you don't have to, and that's what you wish to do, don't worry about this. It's just an option if you want to take advantage of some of these slightly tweaked protections. So it's, it's a very practical approach because well, they don't want a business to have to suddenly do something different in the UK if they don't want to do it. Yeah. So it's quite a fascinating approach. And I'm just wondering whether over time, the European Commission, the European Parliament, might take that practical approach, but yeah. we never know. I mean, we saw it with the standard contractual clauses that, yes, the UK has its own intra-group transfer, I'm um, sorry, um, international data transfer mm -hmm. agreement, but it also just said European SCCs are fine as long as you add a couple of words in. Yeah. They're very likely yeah. to probably recognise New Zealand transfers. Yeah. And, and that the ICO is very keen on getting away from bilateral mm -hmm. demands from one state yeah. and having some kind of framework that everyone can understand that you can allow transfers everywhere. So. Yeah. And I think what we'll probably do, that was very interesting, we'll probably end there. I'll ask you one question, which is quite difficult. If we, if we are back here, maybe in Athens or maybe in Brussels in 2028, so another five years, what do you think is one topic that we might be talking about? One topic, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. That's what I wanted <laughs> you to say. I didn't prep Inga for that, but you know, it is just going to be, the, in fact, it might not even yeah. be us. It'll probably be our avatars here and we'll just stay at home. Um, but if that's one thing that's fascinating, you know, we've looked back over five years, but I think for everyone who's watching, um, we are going at Yusuf Boris to do a lot of sessions on AI this year, over the next year, next two years, three years. So watch out for those and thanks very much for listening.